Thank you, everybody, for joining us here. I'm very proud to present my biography of Bob Steele. And for anybody of a certain age, probably spent many, many hours over many years listening to that wonderful voice mm -hmm. on WPIC AM 1080. And uh, again, I've got probably maybe a minute and a half for the slides each. And again, it's going to be a, kind of a quick run through, but uh, forgive me for that. What was the idea behind the book? Back in the summer of 2017, just basically three years ago, I was uh, looking at some postings on an old Hartford uh, Facebook group, and somebody had expressed regret that, uh, sorry, that I usually put out a posting commemorating Bob Steele's birthday anniversary, and he was late in doing so, but I just happened to see it at the right time, and then all of a sudden, it dawns on me that there's no single volume biography of Bob Steele. There are a couple of books written re with regard to his humor, uh, his word for the day that was uh, co-authored uh, between Bob and his uh, son, Phil. So there were a few books about him, but there's no real definitive uh, single biography life of Bob Steele that you can just pick up and uh, read about his life story. The bottom picture there, you'll see the Bob Steele century that was all the ephemera that was curated by his son, Phil, and all these items were donated to the Hartford History Center at the Hartford Public Library downtown. And uh, I ended up buying a set of books myself at quite, quite an expense, but it was very convenient for me to be able to do a lot of the research for the book just by referencing those. Bob Steele's early life, he was born as Robert Jesse Steele in Kansas City, Missouri on July 13th, 1911. He changed his middle name to Lee because he encountered a neighborhood bully at a fairly young age and he didn't want that middle name to be associated with Jesse the bully. So that was, that's what prompted him to change his middle name. His parents divorced when he was about six years old or so. His father was uh, one of these traveling farm product, product uh, agricultural product salesmen, was not home very much and apparently caused a rift in the marriage. Uh, so kind of unusual to the time that uh, Bob Steele is a product of a broken home, but he spends many, many years taking care of his mother, as we'll see as we go through the rest of the presentation. As a young boy, he builds a crystal radio set, and we can also think of Bob Steele's life as really paralleling the birth of radio. So their ages, in terms of when they were born, there's not a significant difference. And Bob Steele learned to build a small crystal radio set when he was a young kid, and that generated his interest in wanting to do radio work and in the ensuing years. And he finally completes high school in sort of a stilted fashion. When he gets to high school, he works for a couple months. He goes to school for a couple months. He tag teams back and forth. And it takes him a little bit longer than usual to finally get his high school uh, diploma. And sometimes he would make fun of this, which he liked to do a lot of himself. Uh, he referred to himself as HSG, standing for high school graduate. But uh, he was nonetheless very proud of this because back in that day, graduating from high school really was quite a significant accomplishment. And of course, along the way, he develops a love for motorcycles and automobiles. He becomes a boxer. Uh, in part, he becomes a boxer to help get extra income to support him and his mother. But he's always had this fascination with boxing, really that love just as mo motorcycles and especially automobiles really carried through for his entire life. Because of the complications of the conditions of the Great Depression, which began in late October of 1929, Bob Steele ends up moving to California, to Southern California in Los Angeles, and his mother followed him there in March of 1931. And of course, at this time, as he himself said, Bob Steele said, you couldn't buy a job back then because the economic conditions were so bad. But because of his work with motorcycles, he became a motorcycle courier for a bank in Los Angeles. He became a stuntman at the motorcycle shop that he worked at, he knew every aspect of motorcycling, whether it was racing, uh, performance, maintenance of the vehicle, that sort of thing. He works at an Indian motorcycle shop in Los Angeles. And of course, this is very dear to people in this area because the Indian Springfield, uh, Springfield, Massachusetts uh, motorcycle uh, factory, that's where they were located. And Bob Steele becomes a writer of sorts. He comes up with something called Crocker Throttle Cracks. And it was a very humorous, motorcycle oriented essay that he would submit to Motorcycling Magazine. And he did this to uh, capitalize on his writing talent, but also he realized, wow, I can write, submit articles and get paid for them. So again, that idea of income was very not far from his mind. And over the time, the various vocations he had, of course, again, motorcycle racer and a hill climber. He was a competition hill climber, 
a boxer when they were still in Kansas City. Bob and his mother opened up a sandwich shop, which ended up being a failed venture. But nonetheless, it was something that they were trying to do, again, during the throes of the Depression to be able to get some sort of income. He worked as a timekeeper on a farm, again, worked as a journalist for Motorcycling Magazine. I believe his first article was submitted. He was only 15 years old, so he's very precocious with his writing ability, and he also becomes a racetrack announcer in California. Two things associated with this, the magazine page that you see there, that's one of the essays that he submitted. You'll notice that there's cartoons that accompany that. He was also a fabulous cartoonist, very primitive nonetheless, but uh, very, very talented as far as being able to enhance his written work with caricatures and such that he could draw. And the humor also came through everything that he wrote and also with, uh, with regard to the cartoons that he drew. And I put a special gold star next to racetrack announcer in California because as he's motorcycle racing, you can imagine there are more than a few accidents that he was involved with that almost cost him his life. Of course, motorcycling dangerous to begin with and then racing stunt work, uh, those sorts of things make it even more hazardous. Well, he was laid up one day. He went to a, a track in California to uh, just basically watch the race. And it turned out that the announcer for that day's events was not able to attend. So they needed someone <laughs> to fill in immediately. And what happened? Bob Steele finds instant favor with the crowd because he's got this wonderful sense of humor. He knows all aspects of motorcycling. He's an immediate hit. So I put a gold star next to that because this was now the uh, coming out, if you will, of Bob Steele as an announcer, even though he's not on the radio, but he's got exposure talking to people directly with that wonderful sense of humor. So he heads east. The motorcycling season was being uh, sort of ginned up, if you will, by a man named George Lanham, who was a mm -hmm. motorcycle promoter, and he wanted to spread this new sport, this new spectator sport, to different parts of the country. And what ends up happening, he has a race is scheduled at Bulkley Stadium in Hartford. He needs an announcer. And again, Bob Steele, by his own words, said you couldn't buy a job back then, so you either followed employment or you went unemployed. So he kind of followed his love. He arrived in Hartford, Connecticut on May 10th, 1936. He called the racing season and was ready to go back to California at the very end of September. But he stumbled into an audition at WTIC. Their studios were on the sixth floor of the Grove Street building right in downtown Hartford, part of the Travelers Insurance Company at that time. He stumbled into an audition. He won the audition and literally was on the air the very next day. He had an appointment that lasted for 66 years. And uh, just very quickly with this slide, at the top of the job application that he filled out is that disclaimer. It says it must be understood by the applicant that the approval of an application does not carry with it the promise of a permanent position with this company. And when I read that, I really laughed out loud because again, uh, the, day, the day after he filled that application out, he began work at WTIC and remained on the air through 2000. Of course, in a part-time role later on, but nonetheless, it really was for him permanent employment. The most important person that he ever met was Ostrich Shirley Hansen of West Hartford. And some of you living out that way are probably familiar with Beverly Road. And Beverly Road was a construction site of sorts many, many years ago. And Astrid's father, uh, Olav, uh, of Swiss, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, of uh, Swedish, uh, Swedish ethnicity, was a bricklayer. He especially was building chimneys, but he also built uh, homes. And uh, one of my professors at Trinity still lives on Beverly Road. When he saw this, he called it to my attention. He said, um, they live in a house that was also built by her father. So quite interesting. But uh, Bob Steele meets Shirley, as she uh, later on went by her middle name. Um, she worked at Travelers and just happened to be sharing an elevator ride with Bob one day. And he was smitten <laughs> immediately and decided, I have to ask her out for a date. Uh, he does, and uh, his history would have it. Uh, they ended up getting married. They had a very lengthy marriage. Uh, and the photographs that you see there, uh, they were engaged in the fall of 1937. So their courtship lasted for, I forget how many months. It was only in January, February of that year. It was probably like uh, roughly a six, seven month courtship. And I included the envelope because he would always send her special address, uh, special delivery uh, love notes and funny cards. And you can see his artistry is at work on this too. He's not just simply uh, sitting down with a pen and writing out the address to stick in the mail. You see the little caricature of himself 
up in the top left-hand corner, uh, the striped shirt with the pencil going through his head, uh, and all the fancy artwork to describe, uh, to list her name and with the address. So he's really, uh, really quite an artist that uh, he never lost that talent. And again, he joins uh, w WTIC in October 1936. He segued into the, uh, just being a staff announcer, to being on the G Fox Morning Watch program. In 1938, he went to his uh, superiors at the radio station, said, gee, everybody has to wait for the next day's newspapers or the afternoon newspaper to find out who won the games that afternoon. Don't forget, we're still playing a lot of afternoon baseball. Night games were uh, only really slow, very, very slowly starting to come into their own. So he comes up with an idea to do an end of day if you will, sports show, just called Strictly Sports, went on the air at 6.30. It was just a 15-minute segment to get people caught up on what happened in sports that day. And that became uh, a fixture of part of his programming. And, of course, the morning watch over time eventually segued into the Bob Steele show that so many of us became familiar with. Bob and Shirley, after they got married, they lived uh, in Hartford for a short time. And then as the family expanded, they moved to Wethersfield in June of 1941, Eventually, the family expanded to four sons, and they're all pictured there in the lower right-hand corner. And from left to right, we have Phil, we have Bob, uh, Robert, as I refer to, uh, standing in the back with the dark sport coat on, the young Stephen, the little baby in Shirley's lap, and then Paul, the second son, on the far right-hand side. And of course, many of us are familiar with, his, with Bob Steele's famous features, uh, the word for the day, of course, was uh, probably something he's most famous for, most remembered. His tiddling winks were all these little funny news items that he would find on the, uh, on the news wires, the old teletypes that came through, and he would edit those to, to kind of fit his own style of presentation. He wouldn't change the content or the meaning of the, the, uh, the story, but he would just uh, edit those to, uh, to suit his particular broadcasting style. Of course, no school announcements where I called various venues to say, oh, you're interested in having me do a presentation of Bob Steele. Uh, in many cases, the person I was speaking to, that would be their immediate reaction. Oh, the no school announcements, because that's what the, <laughs> they remember him most famously for. Uh, he would give 80th birthday notices, uh, including doing his own when the time came in 1991. Uh, he interviewed countless sports personalities. He became very familiar with uh, sports personalities over the years. The most famous of them uh, being the proud and joy of Middletown, Connecticut. And of course, after he moved to Hartford, making a name for himself as the the world featherweight champ there's a little picture there of willie pep time checks and the antenna switches were also part of his his repertoire and he also had something that he jokingly referred to as the 100 percent wrong club he was uh, notorious for always making wrong predictions with regard to who who might win a particular baseball game or win the world series that sort of thing and uh, he jokingly referred to as the 100 percent wrong club but in actuality because he favored the underdog so much he always said it was too easy to just pick a winner it was easy to go with the new york yankees especially the 1940s and 50s because it seemed like they won all the time so picking a, uh, a favorite was was not among his uh his his stylistic points if you will so he liked picking the st louis browns or the chicago white Sox. he always picked the white Sox for some reason and uh, he was right with them a couple times, but again, he, he enjoyed uh, rooting for the underdog. And this, of course, finally garnished him, garnered him lasting recognition. Uh, in the early 1980s, I think it was for two years running, he had the top market share in the entire United States for radio programming. And that was really an astounding uh, achievement when you consider that we have a fairly large market of Boston radio not too far away. And of course, the, the largest uh, national market, New York City, uh, equidistant about 100 miles to our southwest. So it's really quite an astounding accomplishment. He was inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame in 1995. Shortly after his death, the city of Hartford was peti petitioned, and uh, the old uh, part, portion of Grove Street that actually bisected one of the old Travelers Insurance Company buildings was renamed as Bob Steele Street. That still does have the placards there. Uh, interestingly enough, though, he's not in the Connecticut Hall of Fame. Uh, the honor of bestowing that is the bailiwick of the state legislature. There's a committee of uh, state senators and state representatives handling that, but I don't think any, anyone has been named to that particular entity in quite some time. And again, with uh, all the COVID uh, controversy and such that's going on right now, I guess everybody has better things to worry about. But hopefully one day he will be uh, be enshrined in the Connecticut Hall of Fame. 
I devoted a whole chapter in my book to this, and it gives a, a general background on Bob Steele. He's a diarist. I was able to learn so much about the man because he kept diaries for so many years. It's a little bit difficult to find some of the information because it might not all be exactly in chronological order, but looking at those diaries at the Hartford Public Library, the Hartford History Center, we learned so much about the man. We see what life was like on the Steele home front. Shirley became renamed uh, in a colloquial sense as Mama. Uh, you read Steele's diaries and he said, oh, Mama's in the, co- in the kitchen uh, cooking up a wonderful upside down cake or doing something. So, and he'll make these comments like, no wonder I can't lose any weight because her cooking is so good. He was mm-hmm. a figure filbert. He kept track of practically all the expenses that uh, went through the household. Uh, they go out for dinner and he'd write down, uh, went to the Hearthstone for dinner and we end up spending $31.28. <laughs> or sometimes he even list what they actually ate. You know, so he was really, uh, really quite, uh, quite enamored with tracking expenses like that. And of course, he's a wordsmith. He loved dictionaries, all sizes of dictionaries, no matter how big they were, because these were tools for learning. His integrity comes through because he likes to not exaggerate. He would joke about a lot of things, of course, when talking about serious subjects. Uh, he, he did not like to stretch the truth at all. He did much charitable work. The American Red Cross was one of his, uh, one of his big causes. Uh, I believe he was a member of the 10 Gallon Club. So, uh, you know, he put, his, uh, he put action behind the words that he spoke. Uh, this was especially important during World War II. There were a lot of blood drives back then, and he was only too happy to lend his increasingly popular name to exactly that. Uh, puns, of course, and his self-deprecating humor were his stock and trade. You didn't have to listen to uh, too much of any one of his programs to realize you know, there was, his timing as a, a stand-up co- comic was, uh, was really, uh, really without, uh, without any peer. He was fabulous enough to, to be able to do that and uh, making fun of himself. He, he would never read uh, fan mail on the air unless it was critical of him. Uh, if you wrote a letter to him and said, gee, I really enjoy your show or whatever, he might enjoy reading that, but he would never put it on the air because he didn't like to promote himself in that way. He liked to poke fun at himself. So when he got critical letters, uh, he would always address those or usually incorporate those into his show somehow. I talk a little bit about in these chapters about working in the studio, just to give a little behind the scenes. Uh, of course, in early days, he would uh, catch a bus down the Silas Dean Highway and take the bus into Hartford. Later years, of course, he would drive into Hartford. But uh, very early, because he'd be on the air in some cases at 5.30, sometimes it was 6 o'clock, but nonetheless, very long days for him. I go through a little bit of kind of like a a day in the life of Bob Steele. We see the humor, the human side of the man. Uh, The puns and the jokes were great, but yes, he had temper and emotions. If things did not go right on the radio show, if he was handed uh, a script with a commercial just kind of written on the spot, if there were errors in it, even if, if... if it weren't grammatical errors, sometimes you would use the, the wrong uh, there, there, there kind of a thing, T-H-E-I-R, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. If the wrong homonym was used, uh, you would really be furious about that, not on the radio, but once he got off the, off the air, uh, he, he would, uh, the, <laughs> the, the people who wrote that script would incur his wrath. Uh, well, <laughs> it would not, uh, not, be very, uh, not be very pretty. And of course, they talk about the legacy that he left behind with regard to uh, the fame that he achieved. I take some historical detours along the way. We have the development of radios, new medium, and again, it kind of parallels uh, the, the life of Bob Steele, uh, birth roughly around the same time. I talk about how WTIC radio was created. I get into motorcycle racing as a sport. The creation of television, of course, uh, really gets a, a firmer footing in the post-World War II era. Uh, we kind of take it for granted now that television was always around, but that certainly was not the case. I talked mm. a little bit about that because the uh, Strictly Sports uh, radio program uh, changed and segued into being a, a television broadcast. And of course, the building at Constitution Plaza enables the radio station and the television studio uh, in its very early years, in the late 1950s, they move across the street to become part of the new Constitution Plaza, which opened up in 1961. So I cover little things like that to give historical context to the life of Bob Steele. And that's it. I think I did a reasonably good job of run through of uh, the slides without missing too many things. Uh, You see the cover of the book there, and I've got my web address down at the bottom. I just added that uh, earlier this morning, as a matter of fact, in case anybody uh, needs any more information, a little bit more about myself. 
Uh, again, my offer is, uh, is ironclad. Books are $15 a copy. I would be happy to uh, sign those. And, and again, Lisa work with you uh, somehow to be able to um, uh, get these out to anybody who wants it. And again, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Mm -hmm.